Well, welcome to Wicklow Fall for um, our live web broadcast, and uh, this is uh, taking place in my office in Wicklow Fall, and I'm Simon Byatt, Vice Principal here today with uh, Reverend Dr. Michael Lloyd, who is the Principal of Wicklow Fall. Um, the subject of our discussion this afternoon, in fact, is an area that uh, I've written on the subject of stress, and Michael will be asking me some questions about that uh, in due course. But before then, I just thought I'd give you a little flavour of some of the things that are going on in the life of Wycliffe at the moment. We're in Oxford term week five, um, which means that our students, many of them are doing exams this, this coming week. Um, but then, as term goes to a close, we actually have two events where we look forward to welcoming some of you in the hall. Um, there's a School of Preaching Week, um, which happens uh, the second week of June. And we have a number of guests coming to that, both as delegates and speakers. And that's always a great week uh, as we finish off the term here at Wycliffe. And the following week, we have a, a conference entitled Surprise by Joy, which is looking at the Christian themes in C.S. Lewis's writings. And Michael will be one of the main speakers here, along with um, Dr. Michael Ward, who's based here in Oxford also. So quite a lot going on, a lot of visitors coming to the hall, and um, it's great to be able to connect with you across the World Wide Web, as well as look forward to welcoming some of you in flesh very shortly. Anyway, over to you, Michael, because I think you're going to um, grill me with a few questions about this particular topic. I I'm going to be um, the Grand Inquisitor uh, today, yes, um, and thank you for asking me to do it. it it's, uh, I've really enjoyed I can't claim that I've read your book from cover to cover, mainly because my copy doesn't have a cover, um, but uh, that's roughly what it will look like it will look uh, nice. when it comes out, which is very shortly, very in shortly. Of days. Uh, so oh. do order your copies. Um, it's, been, it's a fabulous read, but before we get on to, on to talking about that, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, you're married? Uh, yes, so I'm married to Carrie. Uh, we, we live here in Oxford. Um, I am ordained in the Church of England and have been in church life up until the point of taking this job in 2007, uh, serving in churches in uh, Wimbledon most recently and before that in other parts of England. And, and do you have a life before turning your collar around? Not that you did turn your collar around, <laughs> yes, but uh, uh, just very before occasionally. Before you should have turned your collar around. <laughs> um, yes, so I had, a, I had a short career in, in banking, um, in fact in, in Jersey where I grew up. Um, so I worked for a, for a clearing bank there before I went to train the, uh, the ministry in, in, uh, in Oak Hill, in North London. And which is the more stressful, banking or the ordained life? Uh, well, we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> there are stresses in the working world. I am grateful, in fact, to have had a short career in banking because certainly many of the commuters in my parish in Wimbledon were going off, off to do those kind of jobs in the city. Interestingly, in fact, in some of the surveys I've done, the, the Christians' lives often come out as being more stressed in some areas, the non-Christians, and we'll come on to why I think that might be the case, but yeah, there are different different stresses. There are lots of advantages to being full-time and paid Christian work in terms of how you can manage your own diary and you know, often having a sort of uh, a full day off. But on the other hand, there can be a sense of being on call, I think, if you're ordained and sort of available all the time, which can make it hard to switch off. Yeah. Well, coming, coming on to your book, which I, I as I say, I haven't read the whole thing because it's only just uh, uh, been given my coffee. Um, mm. But it, it's, it's a fabulous read. It's really well written. It's got lots of nice little bits of humour, like so, describing somebody as having more letters after their name than I've got in mine. <laughs> little, little snippets like that, which, which I loved. Um, and it's really helpful and really practical. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about why you decided to write on this subject. I, I noticed that you started work on it roughly when I started working here <laughs> at Wakely Fall. And yes. I imagine that's purely coincidental. Purely coincidental, yes, yes, yes. yes. Because actually the, the story goes back a little bit further. Um, so when I was a minister Good. in... That's, that's, that's a relief. <laughs> um, when I was a minister in Buxton, in, in Derbyshire, um, looking after... Where the water church, comes uh, from. Where Buxton water comes from. Uh, yep. A lovely little town in the Peak District. Um, I, at the end of one particularly bad winter, I was, was quite unwell. I had a, a chest infection that went on and on and on. And to cut a sort of very long story short, I ended up going into hospital and had was diagnosed with pneumonia, was in hospital for a week and off work for several months. And I think that, um, there, were, there were a couple of lessons that I learned from that. One was that actually stress is something that's a part of everybody's life. And this had been accumulation of work pressure, um, 
a very young family and Carrie being unwell during her pregnancies and all those things sort of and then and not allowing myself time to really recover so um, uh, you know there was not much time for relaxation and sort of pushing right to the wire and, uh, uh, all the time but the other lesson for me was 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 actually in the recovery process that after I started to get better starting to get slightly itchy feet um, there were lots of issues sort of in my life that surfaced related to control really and um, <clears throat> I remember sort of wanting to get back to work probably doing so too quickly and at the same time being slightly both pleased and anxious that seem, things seem to manage rather well without me <laughs> um, and just sort of resurface you know sort of with my identity totally wrapped up in my work and and actually as I say in this book I mean we kind of most want control of our lives and of, of sense of purpose but ironically, we're probably most in tune with our maker when we recognize that God ultimately should be in control, both of us and, and our lives. And that sort of helps us get a bit better balance on a sense of both ambition, but also in the sense of um, relaxation and rest and things that should be part of our daily life. So one of the answers to the question I'm about to ask you is personal experience in mm -hmm. a sense. But, but um, if you look, excuse the cheekiness of the question, what makes you qualified <coughs> to speak on this? Because you're not a psychiatrist, yep. um, you're not a doctor, you don't have particular knowledge of the yep. workings of the human body or whatever, apart from your own personal experience, what, what qualifies you? Yeah, no, that, uh, absolutely, you know, one needs to be able to answer that question. I think whenever well, you, you are delve a doctor, into this... but not, <laughs> not, not the useful kind. Not of a useful kind, no. Yes. Um, so partly personal experience, and I think there are some things that I've learned about myself over the years that have helped me strive towards balance, even though I don't think we ever completely achieved that. Um, it, I think the second bit to that story relates to my time, in fact, in a sort of um, busy commuter parish um, in southwest London, where um, I wanted to try and connect with people who didn't come to church but lived in the parish. and. You know, if you go door to door knocking these days, people tend to sort of be very suspicious of you. I mean, they say an Englishman's home is his castle, and at the end of the day, the drawbridge is drawn up, and they're huddling behind the glow of the TV. You should try wearing a collar; it helps. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we need to get that in every other question, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so, what what we actually did was that we <clears throat> devised a little survey called the Stress in the City Survey. And we went door to door around the parish with a clipboard and just sort of said, look, we're from the local church down the road. We're here to talk to you about the subject of stress. And people say, oh, you know, tell me about stress. You know, if you'd have had my commute today or you'd be looking after the children, whatever. We found it was an inroad in. And we asked a number of very simple questions. How often do you experience stress? Um, what do you do to alleviate it? Sort of tick box a few different suggestions. Do you have a faith that helps you when you're stressed? And then asking them whether they'd like to inquire more. So we surveyed all the parish, and I also surveyed the church members, and then we crunched the numbers into a spreadsheet, and that gave us an excuse to go back and to give them the results. But it's become an interest of mine, because I think that we all talk about being stressed, living in a stressful world, and I was interested in, is that a new phenomenon? Is it a peculiarity of living in the 21st century? Is it something that's always part of human existence? And what will I say to students coming out of a place like this? Uh, ministering to congregation members like I had as to how do you live a life in a stressful world. Mm -hmm. So it emerged out of a particular mm -hmm. context, personal experience, but also the more corporate experience of the, of the society that you were living in at the time. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, and qualifications, not being a doctor or a psychiatrist or whatever, what are you bringing to this? Um, so obviously some personal insights, but I mean I, I try to make plain in this book that I'm, I'm not medically trained yeah. um, and I'm writing somebody with some theological insights. Right. So you know I do believe that there are two particular ways of approaching the subject that I think would be very helpful. Number one is to realize that every human being is made in a certain way um, and that we understand who we are as human beings from reading God's word and appreciating what it means to be a creative human being made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. And that will have a lot to say to help everybody, I believe. But I suppose more particularly, you know, what do we want to say to Christian believers about some things like the rhythm that God has built into the, not only the created order, but actually to the life of worship and um, spending time resting as well as honouring God in, in our work and our worship. So in a sense, though the book is entitled <laughs> Stress and is about stress, it's, it's actually also about living a full life, living 
the kind of life that is A, healthy to you, and mm. B, glorifying to God. And yeah, I mean, the, the illustration that, that I've used that I find quite helpful is that I mean, I've done quite a lot of long-haul traveling, and I do find that um, getting over jet lag is, is very difficult, and tried all the kind of tricks um, to, to do so. But the, but the one thing that I have found has helped a little bit has been if... Um, a day or two before you get on the plane, you start sort of changing your watch according to the the time of the destination you're going to, eating according to that time scale, and trying to sleep according to that time scale. When you actually reach your final destination, you've already slightly recalibrated. Yes. And for me, living the Christian life for the long haul is actually all about um, setting our clocks on the values that, that God has for his kingdom and trying to sort of kind of recalibrate the way we live and think according to God's agenda. So so that's it's all about living the Christian life in that respect, of which stress is one expression of the complexities of living life for the long haul. Yeah. So you're, you're coming to it as a theologian, <clears throat> and therefore um, looking obviously to, to scripture Mm. As as a place to learn from, yeah. And and what what? How does the Bible help? What does it have to say? What does it have to offer? I mean, it's it's not a how to guide exactly. Yeah. But so how how does it help? So, so some of the chapters are deliberately theologically focused in terms of understanding um, God's identity. So if we do believe that God is ultimately in control that actually helps those of us who feel that we have to be in control to sort of wrestle with that. So we spend a little bit of time exploring that. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that actually um, Paul also says in Romans 8 that in all things God works together for the good of those who love and are called according to his purposes. So the circumstances might not be ones I choose, but in God's tender mercy, God can use them, stress being part of those circumstances. But then there's also a, there's actually a lot of very practical living for, for the Christian life. Mm -hmm. So the, the rhythm of six days labor, one day's rest, mm -hmm. um, we need to think about what that means in a globally collect connected 24-7 day and age, but there still seems to be something about laboring for six days, which is wider than the work that we do when we're in the office or whatever job we do. It would include perhaps shopping, perhaps gardening, but looking after the children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but then one day of rest. Now again, rest that's appropriate to what your work is. I and mean, if you're a lifeguard, you might not go for a swim on on your your day of rest. Um, and if you're a mountaineer, you might not go for a walk in the hills. I mean, you know, you when, know my point. When I was in Newfoundland. Um most people there were involved in the fishing industry, mm. one way or another, and what they would do on their day off was go line fishing instead right. of sea fishing. Oh, so it's a big difference. It's <laughs> yeah. a huge yeah. difference. Yeah. Very important <laughs> to make distinction. So, so that, and for me, I think there's just one, one illustration, but I think that there's a certain amount of self-knowledge and self-awareness mm. is important there because depending on how you're wired, you might find that the best way you rest is by traveling into the city and going to a museum. Mm -hmm. I might find that actually the best way I rest is by going into the hills and walking and walking, you know, or possibly both in different circumstances, but an awareness of what it is that you need to do to recharge your batteries. So this is not a prescriptive <clears throat> kind of list of what you should and shouldn't do, but, but a, a structure and a framework for... Yes, uh, and I mean, it was in interesting rest that during the, the French Revolution, they, they tried various experiments, didn't they, with um, the, the decade, you know, having a 10-day working pattern and then a time off. And they actually found that with a certain amount of experimentation that human beings seem best wired with six on and one off. So that's another good illustration, I think, for me, of where there's a crossover between what's good for every human being. Mm -hmm. So you would say that actually to have a day in which the culture and the nation, in fact, is less frenetic is good for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, we would, we would also want to say that that the principle of Sabbath is also to anticipate our Sabbath rest and to worship the God who made us and to spend time focusing on Him. So there are lessons that kind of apply to everybody, but there are some that particularly apply to Christians. I, I think there's also something about the community resting, isn't it? Yeah. That <coughs> people say well, you don't have a particular day, everyone needs a day off, but the whole, you don't. Have, it doesn't have to be the same. Day. Yeah, yeah. But what but, do you do if anybody else is? But then, if your yeah. if your spouse or whatever <coughs> is not free on your day off, yeah. it becomes not quite 
a full enjoyment of relaxation and community yeah, and, yeah. And, and society. In that Which way. is one of the arguments that some have used, you know, for, for why you still need one day for the nation to, yes. I mean, I think we've strayed a long way beyond that now, but that was the argument that was used, I think, yes. in that yes. So, well, I can see that that's very helpful, and it's one that <coughs> one needs to keep yeah. reminding oneself of um, and, and, and holding oneself to. Um, other, other, other places where scripture is a resource for thinking through. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean lots, and I think it, I think it's quite important to to write realistically because yeah. um, balance is is what we're aiming for, but we never achieve it. I mean, so I mean, even things like um, the Sabbath principle. I mean, you know, we we get busy, we get periods in our life when <clears throat> we like Jesus' disciples, don't have time to eat or to drink, you know, so try to find a bit of space in the countryside, but the crowds pursued him. Um, and so it's encouraging that he, he wasn't straightforward even for, absolutely. for Jesus, was it? Yes, indeed. Uh, and there were times when he was completely rushed off his feet. And I think that's important because, <clears throat> and this is, this is, I think, relevant depending on your wiring, but I mean, you know, the Bible's standards are absolute. <laughs> um, be holy for I am holy, or as Jesus said, be perfect for I am perfect. And, and I wrestle quite a lot with you know, it seems very unreasonable, never going to attain perfection. But one wise old Christian once said to me, but, you know, you wouldn't really expect God to tell you to aim for anything else. So I think we struggle for the balanced, perfect Christian life. We, we, we never achieve it. I mean, that's why all of this stuff continues to be to be real issues. Uh, the illustration that, that I also find quite helpful is um, if you think about sort of stretching an elastic band, Okay, so if you stretch the elastic band too far, it snaps. Okay, so that analogy we understand. But it's also true that if you stretch the elastic band, even not to its limit, but hold it there for too long, then it'll go out of shape. Mm -hmm. And I think that both analogies work in this whole business of rest. That you know, obviously, a, a, a huge amount of pressure can lead somebody to to crack. Um, but actually pressure that is never gets a chance to have any relief, even if it's not at that point to the point of breaking, can also be problematic. And I mean, that was true for me with my pneumonia incident. Uh, I mean, I still have a damaged left lung, and I know that if I don't um, listen to it, you know, and don't actually do cardiovascular exercise because that sort of helps me breathe better and all the rest of it, then something will catch up with me eventually. Um, Whereas, correspondingly, <coughs> if you do it within limits and then keep letting it come back, it will keep it shaped. It keeps its elasticity in shape. Yeah. Yeah. And so and I think that we I mean we wrestle a little bit with with what's the right amount of pressure for me to be um, productive. Yep. So I mean again another analogy the, the, the bow and arrow. If you don't actually pull it taut, you'll never fire anything through the air. Yeah. Um, but how do I know <laughs> what's too tight? And and I if I sort of look at the Apostle Paul's ministry. I mean, he was a hugely ambitious man. I mean, he he writes in in Second Corinthians about you know being naked and, and cold and exhausted and hungry and shipwrecked, etc. And and that you know he was burning himself out. Um, my favourite verse, in fact, in the whole Bible is Philippians one twenty one. Uh, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I see in Paul him sort of wrestling with okay. If I could depart and be with the Lord, that would be far better because I want to go home. But actually, it's better for me to be here because God's got work for me to do, and I'll continue being sustained on that work for as long as I'm here. And it seems to me that, that Paul there gives gives a message that's still pertinent, I think, for 21st century people. Namely, um, we should be working hard for the Lord. There's nothing the matter with a godly ambition. But remember, of course, that actually... This is not all there is, you know, we'll never achieve perfectionist life, heaven is the home, and uh, that's what we're working towards. I, I think the, the fact that there is, this life is not the only one, is something of a stress buster, isn't it? Mm. Because otherwise you've got to get it right, you've got to maximise your pleasure or whatever it is you Indeed. see. Um, whereas, it's, you know, obviously one is striving to do it as well as one can, but there is a certain, oh well, it's not the only one. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I think um, Hebrews 12, where it talks about he who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. And, you know, there are there is there's joy on the road on the way there. So um, it's not just pie in the sky when you die. It's, as somebody said, um, cake on the plate when you wait. You know, so, so there's joy now, but ultimately, you know, that's my true home that I'm that I'm in this for the long haul to get to yes. finally get home.
Uh, what about hate on a place? Because that's a bit healthier than the case. This is true. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think the other thing about um, is you were asking the question: How do I know what's produ productive stress and mm. what what isn't? Is up to a point. Your body tells you, doesn't it? Yes. Um, it, yes. Up to although a point. it's quite hard for us always to listen to our yeah. bodies. Well, that's true. Um, it's easy with hindsight. Um, it's not easy <laughs> when you're in it. Um, but having close friends or spouse or whatever can also be quite useful, I think, for uh, if, if we uh, we listen to them. Um, <laughs> but I think, um, yeah, I mean, the business of you know what is a, a pressure that makes me productive is is an interesting one because I know that you know if I don't have a deadline, um, then yes. I'm nowhere near as productive. Yeah. Yeah. But on the other hand, if all the deadlines are piling up and I don't think I'm going to meet the, tar meet, uh, meet the target, then actually I will probably not do my best work. Mm -hmm. But in that I also find quite helpful is that um, you know I'll sometimes be sitting here at my desk and I'll be maybe preparing a sermon or, or preparing a lecture or writing something, and you'll sort of be laboring over your books and nothing's coming clear and just doesn't seem to make any sense. And, and so then you go for a, a walk around University Parks next door and all of a sudden you think, yeah, that, you know, that's it, I've got it now. Yeah. And, and There was some research recently about how walking uh, makes you more creative. Absolutely, yes, um, no, I, I was very pleased even, to read that. Even a little bit on a treadmill, <laughs> which is, so it's not necessarily even the surroundings, so we might come to that, the surroundings as well. I Indeed. Mean, but just the act, of, the physical act of walking seems to do something. I think there's something about that, it gets sort of the juices flowing. Yes. There's something about the fact that our brain works for us, even yes. while we're not actively engaged in it. Now, I mean, obviously, I don't think that it will become clear just for a walk around the park all day. <laughs> Still, <laughs> I don't think I could write it into my job description either. Um, but, um, but there's something about breaking from the intensity to giving the space, and I and I'm sure that you know God and His infinite wisdom has made us with that kind of rhythm to enable us to be more creative now. And I think actually there's something also about walking pace. That that, yeah. that is kind of our natural <clears throat> rhythm, our natural true. pace. I mean, it, you get stress from flying at high speeds, mm. um, whereas walking somehow sheds that. Yes, and gets you, yeah, no, grounds that you was, almost literally. Yeah, that was, that was helpful. That piece of piece yeah. of research recently. Yeah, let's talk about the surroundings because I think that's an interesting mm -hmm. thing as well. <clears throat> um, exposing yourself to the natural order mm -hmm. seems to. Have, have an impact? Yes. Um, there was a survey done by um, a, a beer company in, in London in the beginning of the century, and they um, did, did, did the survey of urbanites and, and the stresses of urban dwelling, and, and basically people said that the things that help relieve stress are um, the, the sight of the sea, the smell of cut grass, you know, the walk in the park and things like that. And people just pointed to the fact that being in the natural world was something that was stress relieving. Now, and that's for all sorts of reasons. I mean, noise pollution, um, yes. constant connectivity to our mobile devices, and just getting out in a world where you, as you rightly say, uh, the pace slows. Um, but also, I think there is something about us reconnecting with our maker and wanting to be out in the natural world. I'm quite interested in this theme in the Bible because obviously we started in a garden. Mm -hmm. Things didn't go terribly well. No. We got booted out. Yes. And if you think about the biblical theology that's moving us toward the end, and you come to Revelation 21 and 22, that there's there's two pictures that seem to me exist coexist in the in the book of Revelation. One is the city, so it will be perfect urban worshipful living, mm -hmm. but it's also the restoration of the created order. So, you know, the, the lion yeah, lying down the land and you have new earth. And it's interesting that, that actually both of those pictures are there. It's not sort of one without the other, because, I mean, there is something about the ordered city, as Augustine would say, you know, that the city of God being a wonderful thing that is truly as it should be. But there's also something about actually the more we're disconnected from nature, the more it feels like we're removed from the, from the God who made the world. Yes. And the end of the book of Job, I mean, it's interesting hmm. that Job is... I mean, stress isn't the immediate thing one thinks of. He's suffering uh, physically. He's suffering, suffering from bereavement. Um, but those are incredibly stressful things. Absolutely. And, and he's also wrestling with how God has treated him, or how he feels yeah. that God has treated him, yeah. or mistreated him. Um, and 
God doesn't actually give him an answer to his mm. questions. What he does do is take him on a tour of the natural world. Yes. You know, when the morning stars sang together, or were you there when the mountain goats, you know, yeah. give birth? Yeah. It is a tour of the natural world, and there's something therapeutic. Yeah. About just reconnecting yeah, with definitely. the beauty of Greece. There's something therapeutic about beauty. I think. Yeah. No, I think I think that's right, and it's good for us when we when we when we do it. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned, um, you know. That Job wasn't suffering with stress, but actually, I mean, people often ask me this question: you know, Is stress a, a modern disease? Yes, yes. And of course, naming it as stress is probably relatively recent, a matter of decades. But some of those experiences, Job, but actually also the psalmist, you know, wrestling with the brevity of life, wrestling yes. with feeling persecuted by your enemies, wrestling with, wrestling with being dislocated from God. Now, we might say he was stressed. <laughs> so, you know, I think there is help. Actually, there with how do you live a world that's live in a world that's dislocated from God, but and get back reconnected with Him again? Mm -hmm. I think that, that there is much wisdom there in, in the wisdom writings in particular. Yes, and you've talked about the weekly rhythm. Um, talk a little bit about the daily rhythm, mm -hmm. uh, because that that's an important kind of element in it as well, isn't it? Yes, I, mean, I remember um, an instant. Um, for me in my late teens, actually when I was doing my A-levels, and um, I had lots of very bad migraines, mm -hmm. and I uh, was quite active in this youth work, and I remember so one night asking the youth leader, who just sort of dropped me back home to sort of pray for me in the car before I went in, and we had this long prayer meeting, uh, praying for me that God would heal my head and all the rest of it, and which was yeah, fine. Yeah, I've been praying for that. Yeah, exactly that. Um, but the... And I remember um, that it felt like they, my headaches got more intense going through exams and all the rest of it. And just with the benefit of hindsight, there's a little bit of me that thinks if I'd have gone to bed earlier and hadn't been quite so intense yes. um, and sort of rested as well as studied as well as tried to do anything else, then maybe would have just brought a bit of rhythm back into it again. And I think sleep is obviously important. Um, it's complex to get it sometimes, but sleep is, mm -hmm. is important for us. But also, um, I took a, use this phrase of, you know, there being more to rest than sleep. So something about having um, the daily rhythm of, um, is it for, for me, is there any cardiovascular exercise going on in my, certainly several times a week, yes. uh, helps my lungs. Um, am I eating sort of vaguely healthy? I mean, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, so I'm told to look after it well. Yes. Um, and it's not yes. a, a sign of, for me, it's not really a sign of godliness to abuse my body, although I may voluntarily choose to abstain for healthier aesthetic reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but um, generally speaking, I mean, I need to eat. I need to wash. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say something. Yes, exactly. Um, so there is a daily rhythm that, that, that that's important as part of that, and, and worship also is part of that as well. So um, I don't know about you, but I've noticed that... On the mornings where I read my Bible with a degree of attention and I pray, people seem to be much less angry during the day. Have you <laughs> noticed that? <laughs> yes, it's funny that. that. You know, and I, you know, God's, God's just written that into our sort of daily thunder. We're ingesting physical food and spiritual food on a daily basis sustains us. And it's interesting that the Bible actually seems to talk in terms of quite keeping short accounts with God. So do not let the sun go down on your anger. Mm -hmm. Well, you won't sleep if you're, if you're angry, but there's a bit more to it than that. Actually, you know, make sure you deal with the issues of the day today. Yes. Now, obviously, lots of the things we deal with in life are bigger than one day problems, but something about being able to sort of file them and store them and have a system where you can manage the project kind of thing is part of that daily rhythm. So you can actually hopefully get to the end of the day with, with some degree of um, accomplishment. Yes. I, I love Psalm 127. And the whole bit about sleep in that, yes. <laughs> um, which I think is, is, is wonderful, it's uh, in vain do you <coughs> go to bed late and get up early, because he gives to his beloved sleep. Um, there's a futility, there's a counterproductivity mm. to uh, frenetic activity yeah. beyond a certain point of a reasonable work, yeah. um, at which A, makes it not worth doing, but also that, that somehow about... He gives to his beloved sleep. Now that obviously doesn't mean that if you can't sleep, you're not beloved. <laughs> but it does mean that accepting your lovedness yeah. 
it is part of what That's leads to a, a, a yeah. secure life and, a, 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 and has, leads to physical well-being yes. as well as to yeah. emotional and spiritual. No, I think I think that's definitely true. Well, that's, that, those are those are helpful things. What? Um, how much of it is do you think a matter of kind of having a tick box of of activities? I've got my sleep sorted out. I've got my my exercise sorted out. I've got my uh, food sorted out. Um, uh, and how much of it is is more intangible? Than mm. that? That's an interesting question. Um, obviously, if you're, you're the kind of person that lives by the tick boxes, then it might well be that you will function better by a well-scheduled um, eating, sleeping, exercising lifestyle. So, I mean, I'm, that, if that sounds too obtuse, what I mean by that is that some degree of awareness of what it is that works for you is quite important in this whole business. Yes. So, yes. I don't believe that I get this right in my life much of the time, but I do know what I need to do to find refreshment. So, I mean, Carrie and I had a, a conversation. I came back from a very, very busy busy day and um, Carrie said, you know, would you like a cup of tea and a sit down kind of thing? And I said, well, th thank you, that's very nice, but actually, I really need to go and walk around the block, you know, I need, I, that's, for me, that that's that creates the buffer space. Yeah. So I think that being aware of what works for you, and that's why I've tried, I mean, I've mentioned lots of things in here, but I'm deliberately not trying to be prescriptive. Mm -hmm. I think the best thing that could happen would be for you to be, an aw be more aware of what you need to do to sustain a sort of a healthy life spiritually, mentally and physically. Um, and so I've tried to sort of give hints as to how that can happen for you. Right. One of the things that's happening as uh, we speak is that people are hopefully listening mm -hmm. and um, uh, some of them are sending in questions. Yeah. And I thought I might just read one or two of these sure, yeah. if that's okay. Um, there's one from uh, Kathleen Kreuter. Apologies, apologies if I've misspelled, mispronounced mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, but sends greetings from Romania, uh, and he says, whether we're ordained ministers or lay people, we aren't exempt from stress. I think that's uh, been clear from our discussion mm -hmm. thus far. Um, a deadly combination of traits, he says, seen frequently in those serving God, produces inferiority and perfectionism. Mm. Uh, traits that make us obsessive compulsive performers who think we're inadequate and that our service is never satisfactory. And as a result, he says, we become A, over-responsible. Um, we think we must do everything ourselves. Uh, and B, irresponsible. We think that nothing we do is acceptable, so we shouldn't tackle anything. We can yeah. offer between those two things. How do we keep the balance? Yeah, so it's a good, good question. I mean, it, you know, the, the sort of phrase fight or flight has uh, become in, come into sort of English usage from just the idea that whenever we're creative, uh, whenever we're confronted with a stressful situation, we either deal with it, you know, head on, or we run, you know. So it goes right back to our primitive instincts. You know, a, a bear is just about to attack you as you're walking through the woods collecting and foraging. Um, what do you do? Well, if it's a bear, you probably better run. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that the interesting thing is that sort of in the modern world, we get the fight or flight adrenaline rush but it's created often by um, 120 emails in your inbox when you walk in in the morning, or the screaming You're child on the bus. That, by the way. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I delete 119 of them. Yeah. I noticed uh, that. <laughs> but um, so so it's slightly more complex. Our world for most of us who are sort of um, not in manual work or not directly involved in releasing the adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we need to find other ways to do that, whether that be sort of Eating a squash ball, or you know, running, or whatever it is that that, that that works for you, and I think you know that also that hints at the different ways in which we're likely to respond. I mean, I think within each one of us is a combination of a problem solver wanting to say, "Look, this is a problem. This is what I need to do to fix it," and yet there's probably also within us a little bit of a procrastinator and a barrier. Mm. And so to the so the procrastinating self, I need to say, look, you need to plan, you need to organize, you can't always do everything straight away, but what mechanism have you got to make sure you've got lists or projects that you're working on? 
And to the to the problem solver in me, I need to remember that um, life is complex, and the problems I've got are complex, and the things on my desk are huge. I can't always solve everything, and certainly I can't always solve everything in the short term, maybe in the long term. So, so I think, okay, risk, risk of being simplistic, the degree of self-awareness is necessary there to know how I'm responding to the particular difficulty or circumstances I find myself. Is there also uh, something to do our, with our view of God here, mm -hmm. um, that God is both somebody who makes high demands <coughs> upon us, but also somebody who's forgiving, loving, <laughs> and accepting? Yeah. Uh, and and that, that balance is, is important. If you just have one, exactly. it, it affects your lifestyle and... and yeah, I mean, you know, putting it putting it theologically, the, the legalist or the licentious person within us, I mean, you know, the, I can neither fully meet all the demands of the law, but that shouldn't make me be completely unrestrained. And But on the other hand, um, yeah, I'm absolutely dependent upon keeping in mind both God's demand for perfection and his provision for failure, um, which is tremendous, really. Yeah, and, and again, going back to my favourite psalm, uh, Unless Lord, the Lord builds the house, those who labour, labour in vain. Yeah. Uh, if we think we've got to do it all ourselves, um, it's just going to be futile. Yeah, and God, God gives us prayer for that purpose, amongst yes. other things. Yes. I mean, uh, you know, when I went to the house of the Lord, um, David says in Psalm 73, then I saw the faith of the wicked. I mean, there's something about getting life in perspective in the house of the Lord. But there's also, for me, you know, as Corrie Ten Boom says, you know, why don't you take all your cares and anxieties to God? He'll be up all night anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is a delightful phrase. Yes. <laughs> a kind of more free translation. Yeah, exactly. Neither, neither yeah. slumbers nor <laughs> sleep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another, another question here <laughs> uh, oh, from Richard Crocker, actually, who is a friend. Oh, so, <laughs> nice, nice to see you. Well, no, not we are seeing you, but it's <laughs> nice to be seen by you, uh, Richard. And he said, my question is, did your surveys and your research encountered a connection between stress and depression? Yes, um, that is a good question. Um, obviously, um, I put in my disclaimer that I write as a theologian rather than as a medic, but um, I, think there is, I think there can be a connection. I mean, sometimes people who experience depression, and there may be all sorts of reasons for that, but it can be the inability to fulfill our own or other people's expectations of us. And the definition of stress, I mean, I spend a whole chapter trying to define stress, but actually, the, for me, the most useful definition of stress is a very simple one, which is that stress is what we experience when the demands put upon us exceed our ability to control. And so that can make us either the frustrated perfectionist or it can make us very despondent that the demands are too high and there's no way, you know, and so we're, 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 we're all sort of almost immobile by the, the intensity of the uh, demands. So I think that, you know, that there is there is a continuum along the stress cycle of worry, anxiety, um, depression, and, and other related, some of which may be uh, requiring more medical attention, but... But generally speaking, for all of us, um, unfulfilled ambitions and over-anxiety about the cares of this world also requires some theological help, and it's yep. in that domain that I suppose I feel more qualified to, to, to assist. Yes. I think the book is very helpful on that front. And by the way, Richard says, I like the misprint in the title banner, or maybe it was intended, stress the path to peach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know where that's appeared. <laughs> well, a peach sounds good. It, it does, yeah. it sounds very helpful. And, um, and Kathleen Croyser, Helpfully says, "Good job, neither of you look stressed. So <laughs> you should see at one of our staff meetings." Yeah, exactly. Um, well, somebody somebody did come up to me, a student who's now left this place, and said to me, um, "Simon, um, I know that you have got an awful lot on in your world, but could, could you tell me how to relax?" Which was a very interesting comment. And I said, "Well, my initial instinct was, you know, the sight of the swan gliding across the lake, <laughs> and what's going on underneath, because that's what my life really feels like." <laughs> Um, but but the, but the other comment that did seem to help them was I said I suppose the only thing that I have found helpful when life is really really busy is that I've taught myself not to feel guilty when I'm not working, and it that took a while to get to that point, mm -hmm. and I don't always fulfil these things very well. But it was helpful because it was all part of me coming to think that my my identity is not tied up completely in my work. My identity is actually found in my relationship with Christ. And I wonder if there's a 
uh, a theological thing there as, as well. Obviously, there is, but but another aspect to that being, um, if you if you have a kind of gnostic divide between the mm. sacred and, and the secular, then you're always going to be struggling to justify doing ordinary things, yes. eating, enjoying, relaxing, going to the cafe with <clears throat> with friends, going, going out, doing some sport, yeah. walking the, the fells or whatever it might be. Whereas if you see um, no split between yeah. the sacred and the secular, the whole thing is God's will. Yeah. Uh, and of course Christ lived, you know, he was just as much God when he was sleeping mm. as he was when he was preaching. Mm. Uh, and if you have that vision, then it's it's much easier to to justify yeah. all the the rich diversity of, of what it is to make up a human being. Yeah, and I, I mean I am very attracted to that holistic view. I mean, you know, the common people heard Jesus lovely uh, gladly, and they, the crowds flocked to him because he was a deeply attractive human being, um, as well as being the Son of God and the most marvelous teacher and, and preacher there was. And um, I'm not sure that we're always that attractive as Christians <laughs> um, and uh, I think there, 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 sh there will be things that we will say and do that offend people and sometimes that's necessary for out to kill to the world but there should be a certain attraction I think the Bible assumes of a Christian who's living a life that is in tune with their maker in some way or other. Yes and I remember reading a thing by Monica Furlong saying what I expect from Christian leaders is that they will not be driven as I am driven mm -hmm. by the need to fill every moment of their <clears> lives, that they will resist the urge to um, be on the go the whole time yes. and, and therefore offer an alternative to the world and have the courage yeah. to face the, the questions within that come when you're silent and when you're not yeah. filling your, your whole yeah, yeah. life with And again, stuff. that, you know, you want to say both and all the time, yeah, don't you? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the illustration I quite like to use is if you imagine an eight-year-old boy kicking around football on the streets of Manchester, and whoever happens to be the manager of Manchester United now um, <laughs> uh, rolls up in their car and winds down the window and says, you're a great footballer. What about Manchester City? <laughs> yeah, this is true. Could be City. <laughs> you're a great footballer, son. Um, when you're 18, I'm going to sign you for Manchester United. Wow, I mean, you know, every boy's dream has just come true. He's going to play for Manchester United. Um, what would be the effect of that promise? I mean, he's he's had a promise from the man uh, the manager of a leading world football club. I mean, he can go home, uh, put, uh, hang up his boots, watch TV for the next ten years because he's been told that he'll play for Manchester United. The chances are, actually, have the opposite effect. Yeah. Knowing that he's going to be in the team yeah. makes him the most ambitious, the the most rigorous in his training, you know, and so that when he's eighteen, he'll be sure to be match fit. Now, that's a tightrope to walk, isn't it? Yeah. But that's the right motivation, it seems to me, for healthy Christian leaders. I, I, like Paul, will be the most zealous, the most ambitious for the sake of the gospel because I know I'm deeply loved and accepted by God yeah. and a member of his kingdom, and he's promised me heaven and everything else. I suppose the, to adjust your um, rubber band analogy, uh, of course, if you twist a rubber band, you can use it to propel yes. you know, a toy airplane or whatever it is. Yes. Um, and, and that's or very, or very narrow analogy. Um, and that's where it's being created. That's where mm. it's actually yeah. dri driving in the good sense forward, propelling you. Mm. Um, when you overstretch it, it's no longer going to do that or anything very mm. useful. Uh, yeah. and, and it is, again, that balance that, yeah. that is difficult, difficult to get. Well, I think I mean, that was pretty much up. Is there a last question well, from, uh, from the world? Um, yes, there's one. Uh, and then I want one quick mm. one of my own. Um, there's one uh, from Stacy in Texas. So hello, Stacy. Hello, Stacy. Um, <laughs> I know Stacy. And the question is: Is there a difference among generations regarding stress? Mm -hmm. Young people are less prone to overworking and working outside of their passion. I think I think that's right. I I, I see yes. that there's a rebellion against the kind of 60s generation who overwork. Yeah. Amongst their children who say, "I'm not going to ruin my life like that." Waste my life like that. Is, is, do you think there was a certain? There's. I think I see some evidences of that. Yes. Of course, the world has ch changed a lot. I mean, and so for example, when I was a was a vicar in London, I mean, 
the working life was incredibly stressful, especially if you're working in the markets, yeah. you know, where you're waiting for the rest of the world to go to sleep before you can go home, and then the rest of the world woken up before you, you know, had a chance this to go to sleep. This is the stock market, not Covent Garden market. Yeah. Well, that, that's quite early night <laughs> in the morning as well. Um, and, the, you know, the, one of the things I saw is that by their mid-40s, a, a lot of these um, men and women have burned themselves out, really, just by very little sleep and 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 you know, hugely stressed and went on something else. But there is also a bit of a work hard, play hard mentality as well. So often their idea of a weekend off looked exhausting to me. So, you know, that's part, that's a men mentality. But I think that the other complexity, I think, is just the connectedness of the modern world. I mean, you know, we're all glued to our um, mobile technology and, you know, email and, and social media just follows us around. And so I think that that has some advantages. So you don't actually have to always physically be in the office to be able to be on top of things particularly, but the difficulty is then completely getting away. Yep. So I would say that a lot of the pressures are there in every generation, but they might manifest themselves slightly differently in each, in each new age. And the question I wanted to ask is um, one of the uh, recurring sources of, of illustration uh, here is, is your home mm. land of Jersey. Yep. Uh, home island. Um, how has that affected your thinking on on this um, area? Well, Jersey is a is a wonderful place to uh, to to grow up. Um, this commercial yes, is sponsored by that. the Jersey <laughs> Tourist Board, um, <laughs> and uh, love it. You know, lovely. I, and I just lived for the sea. I had swam and sailed and fished, and you know, I always knew what the tide uh, state was and all the rest of it. Um, and it was. I mean, it was it was a great place to live. I mean, the thing is. Um, People have this dream of going off to some tropical island, which Jersey, and, you know, and that we'll escape stress if we just spend ten days there. But we actually find that we take the stresses with us yep. because it's all to do with in here. Yes. But on the other hand, I think the connectedness with the natural world has all has been very important for me. Um, and for example, the sea um, is both awesome and terrifying, and also very awe-inspiring. Um, at the top of every slipway, you've got a notice in Jersey that says "Time and tide wait for no man," because the tidal flow is enormous. And you know, I, I, a friend of mine, in fact, low water fishing there once got got caught off on a um, sandbank and had to be rescued because they got so pre-absorbed with um, with sort of fishing down there. And and the, the the sea incites that kind of terror in us. Reminds me of how big and vast and great. The creator god is, yes. um, but it, at the same time, it induces awe and reverence and respect and wonder that God has made such a such an amazing world. So Jersey's great, right. and there's a real rhythm, of course, to the yeah. tides, to the seasons, to, <clears throat> which is again Absolutely. something about living in, in harmony with yeah, that. Def yeah, definitely. Yes. Well, as you say, we're pretty much out of time. Um, I, well, I'd like to commend this because I. Though I haven't read all of it, it is a fabulous read, and uh, I, just, I think I find it really helpful myself. Um, it's published by Intervarsity Press over here. Mm -hmm. um, it costs eight pounds ninety-nine, which is about fourteen dollars, something no. like that, mm -hmm. um, and a snip at the price. It's coming out on very shortly. In, yeah. yeah, and there's, um, you're having a book launch. Yes. So if you find yourself Oxford Way on the eighteenth of um, June. So Wednesday at five o'clock, uh, there's a book launch here at Wycliffe, and if you'd like to come to that, just drop us an email, and we'd love to host you for that. Well, Simon, thank you very much for this time this afternoon, but also for the time writing the book. It's it's uh, a fabulous contribution, I think, to church life and, and, and wider. Um, and uh, just before we go, um, what 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 are you going to do next? Uh, you've written about marriage. You've written about Lives Jesus Changed in uh, John's Gospel. Uh, you've written about preaching. Mm -hmm. um, well, the joke, as you know, is that, that that actually it's been quite a stressful time in our life for all sorts of reasons that we've been writing this book. So a friend came up to me a few months back and said, Simon, will you think very carefully before you decide what to write on next? So maybe I'll write about prosperity. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a fun idea. Yeah. Uh, and I'll stay friends. Yeah, indeed, exactly. Thank you very much for Thank joining you, us. Thank you. Goodbye.